Taylor Walker from the Abbo Crows, and you're listening to the Coaches Panel. Shannon Hearn from the West Coast Eagles. This is Nathan Jones from the Melbourne Football Club. Phil Davis from the GS Giants. That's Brad Avery from the Port Adelaide Football Club, and you're listening to the Coaches Panel. Happy Australia Day to you. It is MJ from the Coaches Panel. Counting you down, who I believe are the 50 most relevant players for Supercoach, AFL Fantasy and Dream Team. We put them in one big combined universal list. And you can have your say on any of the players, including Isaac Heaney, who smack at the half bang mark, number 25 on the 50 most relevant, right across our socials. Uh, to help me talk about the number 25 most relevant player, I've gone for who I think is the most Australian person I know that fits. His name is Steve Fears. You best know his work from the Draft Doctors. Hello, mate. How are you? Oh, I'm very well, MJ. Thanks for having us on. How are you doing? Oh, mate, I'm good. I'm actually really excited about Isaac Heaney. Like, full transparency, when I first put his name on the list and I started to think, I'm like, oh, maybe I'll just upgrade him or, or maybe I'll go against him. And I'm keen to get your thoughts in a few moments. But I found myself more and more interested across all formats in starting with Isaac Heaney because he is one of the most consistent scoring forwards available to us. And sometimes consistency is kind of a bit of a dirty word in the fantasy community, but but I don't think it can be when we're talking about Isaac Heaney. He's just 22 years old. He is forward eligible. There were some amongst the community that thought he may lose that, but no, good news for us. He's there and there again. And his best fantasy score in 2018 came against the Saints. It was a one 134 in Supercoach, and it was 118 in AFL Fantasy and Dream Team. He averaged over 90 for a second year in a row across all formats, just over the 90 mark in AFL Fantasy and Dream Team, and 97.4 in Supercoach. He's going to set you back about only about 530,000 in that format of Supercoach, and pretty similar to his Fantasy and Dream Team price, around that 650,000 marker. Um, Steve, when we talk about this guy, he's been a, a staple of, of our forward lines as a premium over the past couple of years. And it's crazy to think that there's so much potential upside with him entering into his fifth year, starting to put it all together. He's one of the most consistent fantasy forwards we have going around today. Yeah, I think you're right, MJ. And um, he's certainly a very desirable player within, um, within the fantasy footy realm. I think a lot of people like having him on their rosters in, in salary or draft. He, he is, you know, he possesses this combination of, of poise and class, both inside and outside of the contest. And, and then when he does go forward, he's one of the cleanest overhead marks in the game, not just for his size, but just in general. And even with just limited midfield time, um, he's still proving to be a pretty formidable fantasy scorer, uh, ranked eighth. Uh, for forwards right now across the formats. If if you drill down into his numbers last year, nine super, um, AFL Fantasy and Dream Team tons, 12 super coach tons, and really outside of the injury-affected game against the Tigers in round 15, if you take that out, which is always dangerous, I know, man, when you're like t- taking scores where they got tagged or injured, but early injury-affected games, I kind of feel happy to do that with. If you take that injury-affected game out, he's averaging 94 in Fantasy and Dream Team, and over the ton in Supercoach. And that's off the back of his breakout year in 2017, where he jumped his averaged up 18 points a game up to 92 in AFL Fantasy and Dream Team, with uh, the seven tons and the 97 in Supercoach, with eight scores over 100 in just 18 games. We're seeing a guy that, yes, he's getting midfield time, but a, a ton of forward moments still, and yet he's still pumping out top 10 average numbers. Yeah, he's pretty uh, pretty incredible, and, and yeah, looking at that injury affected game where he had the the concussion, he um he was tracking along at ninety eight dream team and one hundred and seven super coach, so it's pretty easy to point to that and say uh, there's room for upside. Another thing I like is the the fact that you've lost a couple of outside players in Hanbury and Nick Newman. When Nick Newman was in the team, particularly at the end of the year, uh, that that's when his scores were maybe below par, I guess you'd say. So one area that Heaney can get better in is winning uncontested ball. Like we've really only seen him go over thirty touches once, I think, and yeah. and he and he wins most of his possessions in a contested fashion. Uh, so I guess th- there's upside there, but also maybe the way Sydney moves the ball is a little bit of a concern. 
Yeah, it, it certainly can be. I, I think if you look back over the past couple of years, because there is certainly some potential for him to build in some kind of scoring um, columns of his career. But if you look back at the past two years, the 39 of a possible 44 games, and his average during that time combined, 91 in fantasy and 97 in super coach. I think what's encouraging, which feels odd to say it is, the lack of hundreds during that period of time, just the 15 fantasy tons, the 19 super coach tons, which is pretty low frequency of hundreds for a guy that's averaged you know, high 90s and low 90s, depending on the format you play. I guess what that points to is this scoring basement that he has. It's not so low that he's going to burn you a la a Dane Zorko. No, well, he's, he's generally avoiding the tag and he scores in all the, the right areas. He tackles, he marks, he kicks goals. And he does win his own ball, which is really impressive. And I think even last season coming into the, the year, he was, was it last year, the glandular fever year? Yeah. Yeah, so he's coming off a limited base there. So he's certainly someone who's capable of stepping up into that elite territory. Yeah, I'd be really comfortable with with starting or choosing to to upgrade. And and as we've highlighted over a couple of times through the 50 most relevant, either in the articles or the podcasts, um, we've talked about Isaac Heaney as a contrast point with someone like a a Josh Dunkley, who certainly has a, a considerably higher ceiling across all formats. Um, and to contrast that to Heaney, but it's but it's not actually meant to come across a, as a criticism. If anything, it should give fantasy coaches greater confidence to select him. That if he's able to average these ninety markers and not have these regular, consistent, big high hundreds, what what can he do um, if he starts to, as you've said, pick up that extra midfield rotation here or there with some of the more outside players that have departed the team, um, and and also um, just getting that full fitness base into his body. I think the, the lack of hundreds and the lack of ceiling only bodes well for him, given his scoring consistency. Oh, look, if you're comparing him to a player like Josh Dunkley, I'm 100% more confident in, in Isaac Heaney. Yeah. Because at least I know if I make the pick, it's not going to cost me my season sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, he'll be fine at, at the very least. He might not have the same upside as Dunkley, but he could quite easily say that he does. Yeah, he could. I think you're you're right. You you think about that. I guess that fantasy regret. It's that play that you know. Um, the reward is high, but as so is the variable of the reward to be absolutely punished and that risk that you can find yourself in. So scoring consistency isn't actually a dirty word. Um, and sometimes it can feel a bit that way. Um, across the fantasy community, yes, you want guys that are going to win you matches. You know, with a unique matchup, whether it be in a single season keeper league or your salary cap formats but you could probably build the case that i'm going to choose to take a more a safe or conservative approach and i'm going to build my side around what i know is a safe 90 to 95 with the potential of a hundred forward as opposed to a forward who yep he could go 110 for me but he could burn me and go 80 on the way through so i i think there's positive for coaches that want to start him and there's two sides to the consistency argument i I suppose the one side is i know what i'm going to get and i can build around it the other is if i don't own him he's not going to hurt me yeah yeah and that and that's probably where um where the the battle is especially for drafters but you know in a salary cap team go well look he's coming in at unders you know he's a good pick he might not be the optimal pick but he's a good pick and he won't cost me anything and with draft again you know he's the sort of guy who you can pick and go i'm very safe i'm squared away so it might free you up to take a more risky pick in, in later rounds yeah because you've got to um balance that risk and the reward out salary caps or or drafts don't you you may be going after a a bunch of mid-price speculative op- options whether that be because of role or an injury history um you maybe you do need to balance it out and that's where yes so yeah a, a Dunkley or a McLean yeah they've probably got that higher ceiling than him but he's not going to hurt you in the contrast of those two. Maybe you're looking to roll the likes of a, of a Robertson or a Brody Smith, um, you know, a Pierce Hanley um, through the back line, um, a, a Taylor Adams, you know, these guys through the midfield that have question marks either over the role or fitness or, or varying things. So having a safe 90s forward that you can build your squad around actually could be one of the best things for you if you choose to. Conversely, it may not hurt you if you go the other way. Yeah, yeah, I think that's the perfect way to look at it, MJ. 
All right. Well, I'll be honest, man. I'm keen to get your thoughts. We'll get some draft reflections in a moment. Before writing the article, I kind of had him put away as a, uh, look, I'll just upgrade him. And if he keeps doing what he's doing, it's not going to hurt me. So I'll go against him. I'm probably leaning more and more. In super coach, he's got a bit more of a ceiling. So he was always a lock for my starting squad there. Whereas for fantasy and dream team, I've got to be honest, over doing the research, I found myself more and more going, look, I'm taking some risks elsewhere. I'm going to lock Heaney in. Put him alongside Dangerfield, who I'm pretty confident, as everybody is, that should be one of the best forward options for us this year. And I just feel more comfortable that with my side. I don't feel like I'm going to get hurt and burnt like I could with some other premium forwards that are at a more expensive price. What are you going to do, man? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm probably avoiding him in draft. Uh, personally, I'm sort of one of the people who, who tends to devalue the position a lot because uh, yep. they... Um, there's, there's so many good forwards. I might, um, you know, I think Chad Wingard could potentially score as much as uh, Heaney, and he's probably going to go three or four rounds later. Yep. Uh, in salary cap, I think he's, he's a really good pick. Yeah, I, I'm keen to get your thoughts on where he actually does go in, in drafts, and, and maybe it's different in season or, or keeper leagues. It's probably pretty similar if you're doing a startup one. Pretty safe to think that he's an F1 for most coaches, given he's a, a top eight forward ranking right now. Um, do you see that dropping away? I, I certainly wouldn't go him in the first round, um, and maybe even a stretch you know, early in the second. Where do you kind of predict he'll go uh, as a, a forward in drafts this year? Yeah, I think he'll go anywhere from sort of pick 15 through to pick 30. Yeah. Which people might say is a, is a bit of a big range, but we're going to see Dangerfield go top five in yep. probably every AFL fantasy and super coach draft. So someone's probably going to reach on Devin Smith, yep. probably around pick 12, I would suggest. Yep. And, um, you know, Isaac's going to be the next guy off the board and, and probably that 15 to 30 range. Yeah, which means, you know, he's your F1, but you're able to pick him, you know, on the run back of your second round. But gosh, if you're entering into the third round, chances are you've locked away a, a top two to three ranked player in ev- in every line, at least with your first round selection, potentially your captain option if you play with captains. Uh, and then you're locking in another top five hopeful candidate with your second selection. Gosh, if you can pick up Isaac Heaney, who's a likely top 10 forward, if not top five, you'd be pretty happy with that, with your third pick. Oh, yeah, no doubt. I think that's, you know, that's the way it's going to be. And um, it, it probably comes down to how, how heavy your league goes with the defenders. Yeah. Um, obviously, there's been so much emphasis on on what the defenders could actually score. You know, maybe they just get pushed in front of Isaac King, who, you know, we, we sort of say is a super consistent player, but like you mentioned, maybe doesn't have the, you know, capability of going over 110 per se. Mm. Uh, so I think that's probably going to determine if he goes at, say, pick 25 or pick 15. Yeah, no, fair enough. Uh, when it comes to a keeper league, and especially an established one, chances are the the coach that owns him is going to be really hesitant to sell him for you unless you're considerably overpaying for him. So uh, it would be difficult, certainly not impossible, but difficult to extract him out of a, an existing keeper league side. But in a... In a new one, if you were to start it up today, is he going in a similar range, Steve, uh, for a single season draft as he is for a keeper league, or does he go a little earlier given his age? Uh, oh, I, th- I think he'd probably go in a similar range, to be honest. Um, you know, those young mids are always uh, highly prioritised. Like a, a Tim Taranto probably wouldn't get drafted in front of Isaac Heaney in a, in a redraft, but in a keeper league, he probably probably does. Mm. So. Yeah. All right. Well, it'll be interesting to see where he goes. Look, if if you get Isaac Heaney, whether it be your salary caps or your drafts, you're certainly going to get a great player. He's not going to hurt you at any point uh, right across the year. Hey, Steve from the uh, Draft Doctors, appreciate your help today as we talk Isaac Heaney. No, I appreciate the chance to be here, MJ. I really you know, appreciate it. Love the show and and uh, it's nice to chat some fantasy. Yeah, absolutely, man. If you want to go and check out the article uh, on Isaac Heaney or any of the other players in the 50 Most Relevant, that is at coachespanel.tv. As are all the player podcasts that we have revealed so far. You can go and check that out via Spotify and iTunes. Happy Australia Day to you. We now tip over the halfway market in the 50 Most Relevant. And a player's name that was mentioned on today's episode, he lands tomorrow. <laughs> 